All right, so starting out, I've got my standard palette, and I'm going to have uh, some premixed grays uh, for making little hatches in the base dev cloth. Um, that will take a long time, and it will be slow and boring. So that is a warning, fair warning, that maybe it's the best practice in this session to fast forward. So look at all of it. You know, you can do without my witty dialogue. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it goes super slow. So I, I will be talking about some things. So, I mean, it's not going to be completely... Uh, devoid of content other than, you know, the slow hatching of, of little white uh, hashes, but it doesn't move very fast. So, uh, I don't know, fire beware. So, um, yeah, so like I said, full palette. Uh, I really, really like to have my full palette out. It's like uh, if you're a piano player, you'd want all keys and if you're typing on a, a, a computer, you're going to want all your um, all your letters and numbers. Right? So I do that for my palette, but I have um, pre-mixed piles too, and that's a little atypical of my palette. And the reason for that is because I'm going to, you know, this is my blocking color, and I'm going to be using it to tweak uh, tweak the values that are up there, but. Like I said, this is going to be very slow. It's going to be very, um, I don't know, uh, you just get into it and it becomes your own and it's just kind of, it becomes almost like uh, automatic, like you're not really thinking that much anymore once the pattern gets established. So it takes a little bit of time just to copy a small section and then it becomes my own. So um, once I get the gist of what I'm doing, then I don't really have to, copy anything verbatim. I'm not counting little slashes or, or whatever. I'm just trying to get a good feel of what I'm doing. And then, um, and then if it just becomes part, just kind of part of the way I see it, it's, it's going to be really, um, I don't know, kind of tune out a little bit and just do it. <laughs> so it's going to be really slow. So I've been uh, debating with people about whether to do all of it live, I think it would just be too boring. So we'll be able to gauge it better at the end of this sitting. I think it'd be better for everybody if I just recorded it on the side. This will be an example live, and you'll just know that the rest of it's going to go the same way. And then when I dub the full video, it'll be um, – when I dub the full video, it'll be more of the same, but you'll get to, you'll get to watch all of it sped up. And so in speeding up, it's, it's, yeah, I, I intended from the very beginning for every brushstroke to be on display of this very long and complicated still life. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be turning this into that. And it's going to take a while. <laughs> yeah, you say that now, Sandra, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> So the first thing I want to do is uh, just take some of this mixing pile and create a bright. So my first guess at making this gray, it was a little bit too bright and a little bit too purple. I'm going to use that and just add a ton of white to it and um, we'll see what happens. Maybe it'll be bright enough. Maybe not. I don't want this to be pure white. Um, I see brighter lights on the top of the tablecloth. I see brighter lights on the shelves. And um, I, I definitely don't want to keep this up too bright. Now, I can save it with a little bit of glaze work. Um, but obviously, I wouldn't want to glaze tiny little shapes. So what I would do instead is come up with a glaze that I can hit universally, tone it all down, and then maybe just bring a few back. But not, not to pure white. Pure white is going to be a special you know, accent value that I don't want to have everywhere. So let's, let's see what that value looks like. A little... A little purple. I'm gonna brown it down and add some, uh, maybe a little bit more black and a little bit of raw umber and then more white. So I'm gonna keep it about the same value, but I'm gonna take away a little bit of its kind of purple color. 
not that I mind purple. I like purple. It's just, I don't want my tablecloth to be purple. All you purple people, purple fans out there. All right. So let's see if this color and value does better. All I have on here is a tiny little just dot. I want it brighter than the previous sitting. And that's not brighter than the previous sitting. I'm going to put out some more white. I've already used it all up. It's okay to have a big old pile because I don't want to be making a lot of value decisions. I want to keep moving. So I want to, I want to have basically two values to start with. I'm going to have my light and my dark. And when it gets into shadow, I'm probably just going to leave it behind today. Um, and this section does have a shadow. So this would be a good example for just about everything I'll be doing from here on out on the lace, except for the top. The top is a little trickier because it's in perspective and it requires just a little bit more observation. This is going to be, um, it's going to be uh, pretty difficult at first, but then, like I said, it settles in and then you're just kind of painting away because you've got the system down. That's going to be way too bright. Whoa. So I'm mixing up, look at that glare. I'm mixing up a value that's clearly brighter than that purple, clearly less purple than that purple. And um, has a little bit of color and that's cool. Uh, you know, I, I like a little bit of color. I just don't want it to be um, in competition with the basket, with the shells. I want it to look like a white tablecloth. So subtle color is cool and too much is not. And I'm going to get a new paint rag. Jeez. All right, back to it. All right, so here's my new test. Ooh, I like that. And look how dark it is against white. So that's the same color. There, I can't see it. But there's two little dots that are out of place. And they're the same color in different contexts. So right here and right here are the same. So clearly darker than white, clearly brighter than what I already have. I think that's going to be a good place to start. I can always tweak it later. And um, I'm really happy with that for right now. So now that my little testers have already done their job, I'm going to wipe them out and be more intentional. And here we go. Big old pile of paint right here. Tiny little brush. Um, one little note about detail brushes, I'm sure most of you know by now, is detail brushes do not hold much paint. And so um, I have to be really conscious of stopping what I'm doing and reloading the tip of the brush. So I'm starting with a little bit of an easy section. You saw in last week that, you know, I had a, I had a idea of the direction I was going, but then it didn't work. And so I'm, I'm going to be very cognizant of, you know, just stopping to, to just see how it's looking and um, just understand if it's something I need to adjust or even wipe out. I'm going with, a little bit larger than I typically go with lace uh, with these little weaves. And we'll just see. We'll see if it works. So I, I described that as safe. And the reason I described it as safe is because it's really an area that if it got washed out and I couldn't see those little tracks, it would be totally fine. Um, when I get to the edges, that's where I want to really nail it. And um, when I get into the shadows, I, I definitely don't want sloppy uh, brush strokes there. So again, it's just a matter of getting a little bit into the groove. I'm going to copy a little bit um, just to get a system down. And once I have that system going, then I'm, I'm off to the races. So um, if you watched me last week, you would have known that uh, I, 
Uh, what was my point? <laughs> oh, I, I, uh, I just blocked this in with just a simple glaze. It's flat on purpose. And, um, oh yeah, yeah, this is what I was gonna say. I, I didn't like how my design was, was gonna run right off the bottom edge with the scale that I have, and I had to start all over again. That's what I was trying to say. And in shifting the tablecloth, I was just gonna try to make it up so it does fit, and I didn't like that either. So option number three, you know, third problem solve was to actually shift the tablecloth. And so that's tricky for this spot. This spot is a copy. This spot was the copy of the old version. When I shifted the tablecloth, it's not that way anymore. So I'm gonna have to be doing some interpretation. And I, again, this is my painting. I'm not, I don't owe anything to the um, lace tablecloth. And so I'm going to just, you know, make it happen it, it it would be ideal if it were exactly the same and i just didn't have to make any decisions but just by saying that i'd also be saying that uh that'd be like counting hatches i definitely don't want to do that there are artists that really want to capture every detail and i highly respect that i'm not one of those uh, I, I'm a, a solid advocate for the idea that the viewer really cares about the first impression. And then whatever that first impression told them is going to be, it's going to carry into how they see it when they get closer. And so um, if somebody already has a great first impression of your painting, everything they see past that is going to verify that they love it. If they have a bad first impression, everything they're going to see after that is is going to verify that they hate it. And it's really, in my book, that may be an oversimplification, but uh, I think it's pretty true. I, and it's definitely the way, if I go into a gallery, I almost never change my mind uh, after that first impression. Hi, Hans. Hey, Liz. So look at me, I'm already like 20 hatches in, only like 7 million to go. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> so one thing um, I, I mentioned that it, you get in kind of automatic mode, you might at that point miss that there's something you really like. If you, if you go too mindless or you go too fast. So um, I, that's another thing about uh, the way I paint and teach is that I, I want to be on the lookout for what the painting is saying to me. Yeah, yeah I have goals, but um, I can't predict everything that's going to happen in the course of a painting. And um, I really like the idea that I might see something that I didn't anticipate and I want to embrace that. So uh geez i see a, an issue with my blocking and how the, the cloth is shifted but uh, i'm gonna keep going forward so that was what i was distracted about um uh, yeah so again i, I just want to see what the painting is saying there might be uh some moments in the painting that go exactly according to plan and others that I either want to adjust or embrace. So uh, it's the embrace part that we often forget about, that uh, happy accidents. So I don't paint sloppy hoping for happy accidents, but I do um, I do like to paint slow enough to evaluate. It's like, hey, I really like this. I didn't, I didn't see that one coming. So it'd be better, I wonder if I can get that camera closer. It's on a, I bet I could do it. The only the only issue I have is um, if I get the camera too close, then I might have to paint around the camera, which would be a pain. So let me just show you that little section, and it's just that first that first reaction. It's like that that little section that I can respond to and say, okay, it's working, it's not working. 
Um, a lot of times with repetitive busy patterns, you just have to look out for um, the idea that we already described it as repetitive and busy, which means that you got kind of have to have a lot of that busy stuff before it works. And it's easy to judge it too soon. And what I found is a lot of times um, you just need more in order for it to work. Uh, but you can also say it's like, okay, this value doesn't work. This, um, this uh, structure that I'm putting in doesn't work. We'll see. Um, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch out for that. Okay, bunch of books. You don't need to see that. Let's see if that does any better for viewing this intricacy. Because um, I'm looking at my screen, and I really don't see much. Okay, so Liz, how do you see it? Is it okay? Do you see any details? I don't. Well, I do a little bit now that you pointed them out. Yeah. But I think if once in a while you show us what you've done, you know, close like you just did a, little, a minute ago, I think that would be helpful. Oh, you know, I'm not even recording on uh, Zoom. <laughs> Well, you, it's not your responsibility, but I appreciate that you, okay, so let me just. I mean, you don't have to keep it close up the whole time, but once in a while, just lift your painting up and show us what you do. Yeah, got. my big concern is that I've done this before to where I tried so hard to get the camera in view that it hurt the way I was painting. Yeah, I don't want that to happen. You know, just um... Like painting around cameras is not ideal. Yeah, just do what you're doing, and then once in a while, when you've got a big chunk in, you can show the close-up. Okay, so here we go. Now YouTube can see it a little closer, and it's a little inconvenient, but not debilitating. And it did change my angle to the painting. So what am I supposed to do about that? <laughs> this is tough. Uh, yeah, I, if I had a camera like the one at the school, I could zoom, but the problem is in zooming, it breaks down the, uh, quality. So I wouldn't want to hurt the quality too much. Yeah, that camera's at a wild angle. It's pretty distracting, but it's better than not being able to see anything at all. So. I think we're just gonna have to make a small compromise all the way around. I've made it inconvenient to paint. You have this crazy angle and Liz, you're gonna have pretty far away and see very little. So <laughs> see, there's, there's very little good that comes out of painting lace. That's the big lesson here. I can't wait to try. Yeah. It, well, as many times as I've said, I'm never going to do this again. Here I am again. So don't listen to me badmouth it too much. So I'm starting to get the groove of it. The reason, and um, I said this before, but the reason I'm doing this little section is because there's not too many decisions to make. Um, now, technically, since I moved the cloth, this pattern goes further over now. And I have to decide if I want to do that or not. Again, I'm not beholden to the cloth, and I doubt anybody would say, well, if I'm looking at this pattern, it would definitely do that in this section. I really don't think anybody would say that, especially not after the entire painting is super busy and you just it would get drowned in a sea of little tiny hatches. So... Well, uh, I appreciate that, Liz. And your mother thinks so too. Oh, <laughs> she wouldn't say that to my face. <laughs> she said it to me. Right, she'd say something really critical. <laughs> Not this one. She'd say, Why'd you paint that shell? All right, so.
strap in. This is going to be a slow, slow ride. Um, but like I said, it, I'm probably just going to develop this corner. And um, yeah, this area will be a little interesting at least. The, the corners of these shapes will be interesting. But it's going to be a lot of slow moving, repetitive shapes. And so I just wanted to brace everybody for that. And um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to sell this as uh, an exciting setting. It's really, really not. So this section is is pretty radically different than what I saw before I shifted the tablecloth. And there's this little, I can do two things at the same time. I can change the, the drawing to be closer to what I see while I, um, you know, modify the edge anyway. So I'm going to do a two for one thing. And I say this in, in class a lot that a lot when you when you abstract and you go really simple for the start the the next round of shapes is not correction it's not fixing mistakes it's moving the painting forward and that's exactly what i intend to do here it's like well this wasn't a mistake at at all really it was just that i moved the tablecloth and now there's a new pattern here and i i don't owe anything to the still life i could have easily just ignored it but um I'm choosing to uh, modify the shapes to be more like what I'm looking at. And um, at the same time, moving the painting forward. Oh, sorry, Liz, the camera's doing something. Hold on for just a second. Thought I felt something hitting my arm. It was the uh, camera drooping. It's like falling off the table. I don't know why, because it's clipped on there really good. It's after I changed the, I changed it to be closer to the, there it is. That almost fell right off. So, sorry about that. And now you're looking at my ceiling. There you go. Are you close enough? Can you see? Liz? Yes, I can. Okay. So uh, in the last sitting too, I said that I was going to try to, as best possible, avoid um, painting these darks. And what I meant by as much as possible is that there might be some circumstances where I have to. Or not ha again, not have to. I don't owe anything to the tablecloth. I'll, I'll say that for like the fifth time. But um, I want to change it. And that means that if I'm going to make it more like this new pattern, there's a series of darks in here that I'm going to use some of this uh, old space. Jeez, it's happening again. Why is it doing this? All right, Liz, I got to come up with a different idea. Yeah, why don't you just set it up the way you had it before? And then... um, all I got to do is with it, with it leaning so far, it's falling off of the clip to the table, even though that's on there really good. But what I can do instead is just turn the table sideways and get the, the whole table closer. And we'll see if that works. And then you're going to be in the same spot, but it won't have to reach as far. And like, yeah, I don't even know what you're seeing here. You can see now? I don't think that's going to migrate this time. We'll see. So I know how to paint. I think I described it pretty good, but I am no wizard with technology. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, Sandra. All right, go ahead. When you were talking about that you may have to paint into some of those dark areas, you're talking about the, neg the negative spaces, right? Yeah, so okay. let's do that right now. If I mix up a color to try to color match the table, I would do that here first. Too bright, too warm. 
So now I'm going to throw a little bit of black and a touch of blue into that same mix and then try it again. Almost perfect. And now I'll do it again. The challenge here is that I don't want, um, I don't want it to feel like the, the openings are in front of the cloth. I want it to look like the cloth is in front of the opening. So, uh, it's okay to put it in, but maybe a little on the generous side. Let's see. Um, that looks great on my palette, but the reason that it doesn't look great now is because it needs to be very opaque and I don't want it to make it too thick. So right there is not dark enough. That is. So anyway, back to what I was saying is that, um, I don't want, if I put this brush stroke on and it's a big old glob and the edges are from the brown and not from the white, it'll feel like the tablecloth, the openings are in front of the cloth. That's the exact opposite of what I want. I want it to look like the cloth is in front of the little openings here. The other thing that happens that I've, I've known from past lace paintings is that a lot of times that color match looks great now, but because it's a different layer, you know, you can sometimes tell in the raking light that it's that it was done on a different sitting and that I don't know, that's only marginally annoying, but um, again, uh, all that all that can be judged later. So that's the that's the new pattern that I see. And while I'm at it, I could make this one a tiny bit bigger. And then I'll just paint the edges again. Anyway, okay. So um, I was a little generous with that shape because with an impasto, I can still put the cloth in front of that opening. What I don't want to do is two brush strokes. If I do two brush strokes, then I'll have picked up the brown and now it's going to make the cloth a different color. So I want to I want to really thoroughly differentiate cloth from these openings, and um, I just have to be careful that if this brush touches the 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 brown that I just added, it'll pick it up. It'll be on this brush now, um, and then I I don't have any problems when I go back to the palette because now it's fresh paint on the tip of the brush, and with a nice dry painting, it's just going to sit right on top. So. I didn't want to do anything wet and wet on this sitting, but I did want to go for that new pattern uh, because I had to shift the cloth on the last sitting. And um, all good, just a little bit of problem solved. It's very rare that a painting follows every little intention right off the bat. So it's just a little problem solved. And I, uh, if you've been one of my students, you know, I very much go for simplicity and a lot of problem solving. And the more you know and the more experience you have, the better you can problem solve. I think it's just a really crucial part of being an artist. So that did not go 100% according to plan. And I'm not going to panic. I'm just going to weep quietly to myself. <laughs> just kidding. But yeah, here we go. Now, um, there are no shadows in this one. When I blocked it in, it was very straight up and down, but now there's just a little bit of swing to it. So I might be modifying the shapes as I go to accommodate that. And um, like I said, I started in an area that was fairly easy. The only thing that's difficult about it is that is that new position of the cloth. Again, single brush strokes when I touch the brown. And now it looks like it's behind the um, cloth again. That's such a minor visual thing, but it, it makes a big impact. It's just like when you punch sky holes into trees. If the final brush stroke is that dark uh, or the bright sky, it almost feels like the sky is in front of the sky hole or in front of the tree instead of the tree in front of the sky.
Right. Not quite at automatic mode yet, but this is coming along. And again, in in very busy patterns like this, it I expect it to look a little off before it looks good. So the clunkiness of these lines will will really start to get very subtle when it's in the network of a million more of these. And um, I just know that from experience. So uh, seeing it in my mind's eye of how it's going to look when it gets that busyness, I think it's very helpful. The first time I did a lace tablecloth, I didn't have that. The second time I could trust it a little bit more. The third time even more. So I'm not necessarily saying be a one trick pony and paint the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. This is spread out over a long period of time. And I, I take some of the problem solving that I've done in other paintings into these next paintings. And I take some of the problem solves I did in this painting and bring them into some of the other ones in the future. So just bear in mind that the fundamentals are the fundamentals, but they have a lot of variety to them. You're gonna be using them in slightly different contexts all the time. But, uh, you know, these tools that you learn and the ability to understand light and understand texture and understand the, that feel of the brush stroke and the thickness of the paint, all of that translates into the next painting. And you do that over and over and over again for 20 something years and it, you even forget about some of the previous struggles you've had. And that's the danger of uh, teaching from where you are instead of remembering where you were at the experience level of the student that you're painting with. So I try my best to remember what it was like to have to think my way through how to mix a color or plug it into a network of perspective or how to pull off a texture and layer, seeing that next stage before you get to it. Uh, it's all pretty tricky stuff. All right, so that comes up. And then there's a two part. All right. Okay. So sometimes there's a little pattern note that I like enough to really wrangle it to work. And sometimes I like the simple pattern that I'm, I've done that's maybe not the same as what I'm seeing. And that's what I mean by uh, when I've gotten into the groove of things and I know how to make the patterns work and everything, it becomes my own because... Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll just say, look, this is working. I don't need to do anything. It won't improve the painting. And other times I'll say, hey, that, that little moment is pretty cool. And I'm going to make it work maybe by adding a dark or, or not. So um, technically in this little spot, there's uh, a little break in the normal track of this uh, separation of leaf from the inside of this, or not leaf, but you know, rose petal or whatever it is. And um, I have to decide is, is does that matter? Does, do I need to do it? And I'm going to say probably no, but let's just for the sake of getting started, put it in this double pattern. And again, it's just, it breaks the normal track just a little bit. And um, now that I put it in, now I can support it with a little ridge beneath it and to the side of it. And it'll feel like it's part of the rest of the pattern. Again, I, I tested all these browns on the side. 
And then I readjusted after I realized that if I painted with any sort of transparency, then it would change the color. Not only that it would do that, but by how much. And by how much is a big deal. Um, it's like with acrylics when you get that base layer of paints down and then the next layer kind of the translucency, you'll, you'll put it in just where you want it. And then if there's something bright underneath, then it starts getting brighter. Or if you had something dark underneath, it starts getting darker. And that's really annoying. And you lose that perfect value and color and have to do it again. Well, you know, once you get that system underway, then it becomes a little easier to manage, to anticipate. And then when you've done acrylic so many times that you, you know, know not only to get that layer underneath more accommodating for the layers on top, but also you know how to react to it when it's, when it's uh, not playing nice. So maybe overcompensate the value or the thickness or opacity or whatever. All right, so uh, I'm going to save this section for a little while because um, it's really a connector between all the shapes. So I'm going to establish a little bit more of these leaves. But one thing I want to do first is just this shadow wasn't here before, and I want to give myself a little bit of a drawing note to tell me where this shadow is. Because I'm going to just avoid it, and I'll see what happens. If I have to glaze it darker, which I've think will probably happen. Let's just say I'm 92 and a half percent sure I'm going to have to darken this shadow. But just for now, I'm going to coordinate off as um, a shadow shape separate from the, the rest of the shape. So when I hit this border, I'm going to stop. And it's totally, it's actually better for the painting if we see almost no hatching in the shadow. And if you did, it'd have to be super, super subtle. We don't see texture as well in the shadow. There's not much light bouncing back to your eye. And so one way I can pull off the effects of light is by not painting texture. So it's not just simply to save myself a couple thousand little hatches. That's nice too. But it's also because it makes the painting more realistic. That's probably the more compelling reason. Probably. Okay. Yeah, this pattern is so different than before. But again, I'm going to make it work. Uh, I also mentioned before, but I want to reiterate that I can do a lot of value shifting with glazes and not lose this pattern. And so I'm not going to worry about making every value right. That'd be nice, but think about how much concentration and how much slower I'd have to go to simultaneously do all these little detail notes and constantly be shifting the color and value, no thanks. So I'm opting to just keep it about light and dark and these billion little hatches. Yes, that number keeps going up. And um, I'm not gonna simultaneously worry about value. Just simply simple light and simple dark. Developing a feel for how, when the brush starts running out of paint is something that takes a little bit of time. Like I can, I can feel when this starts getting weak and the, the lines don't feel like they have that little ridge to them. That ridge is really nice for a lace tablecloth. And again, this, this looks like a, maybe a little heavy handed at first, but this is gonna be part of a network of many, many, many little tiny brush strokes. And it's all gonna get 
um, just a little bit more, I don't know, believable as a texture. I'm pretty confident about that. And if you watch last sitting, you know, I'm very quick to say when I've done something that I don't feel worked. Not because of self-deprecation. Sure, there's that too, because I'm an artist. <laughs> but also because I feel like it's really helpful for people with experience to mention those things. Not hide from them or pretend you did everything right. There's going to be some areas that get a lot of light and I might do a little half paste. And if you don't know the distinction of a half paste and a glaze, it's basically a glaze with opaque paint. But what it does is it really kills contrast. So if I feel like there's some areas that get extra brightness in here, again, uh, pure white, this is, this is a lot darker than pure white. Well, it's kind of darker than pure white, but it's dark enough that if I wanted some brighter areas, I wouldn't, be flirting with so bright that it competes with the brightness of the shells. But um, by half pasting it, it would it would be kind of like the shadow in that we're going to see the texture less. And both both ideas have to do with contrast. So dark against dark really is no very little contrast or or none. Light against light is very little contrast. And so if I half paste, it'll it'll darken, it'll brighten the darker area more than it will the light. It'll bring them together and um, it'll reduce the contrast. And so if I want to reduce the contrast with brightness, then a half paste is great for that. And if I need to bring together and darken an area and reduce the contrast, then a glaze is perfect for that. So there's going to be a little bit of push pull to make this <clears throat> even more round, but I'm also going to be conscious of these little shadow areas. I'm going to avoid them, and um, this is only step two. Uh, we already did step one last week with the big squint level shapes. They were only going to give us these big flat patterns that if they didn't work, there would be a lot of fixing to do, and I don't want to fix. I want to elaborate, and there's a big, 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 big difference. Elaboration is moving the painting forward from simple to specific, but correction is undoing areas. And so as much as possible, if I get the simple level right and I scrutinize it, then the um, then the painting just, just moves forward from simple to specific. But if I am sloppy and don't scrutinize that those beginning steps, then I'll have little shapes that I have to erase or little shapes that I have to protect, meaning that I'd have to rebalance the entire painting around tiny little areas that almost never goes in an efficient way. But also, too, is, um, you know, the third option being that you leave something that just simply doesn't work just because you worked hard on it. And that, that happens like doesn't sound logical. And it's maybe not, but it's definitely a real thing. People do it all the time. And I can't say that I'm innocent of that one either, because let's say I had this area that I really, really, really love. And it would practically have to redo the whole painting just to keep it. Yeah, you know, there'd be that devil in my ear saying, it's OK, just leave the mistake. It doesn't have to be perfect, blah, blah, blah. And we're not talking about perfect at that point. That's that's compromising the creative vision for your painting. Just just to protect an area that won't look good anyway, because if the whole painting doesn't work, little tiny detail spots won't fix it. 
So that felt like a diatribe. Luxury, not trying to sound luxury. So it's a very slow, deliberate process, and this is the slow part of the slow process. So um, the, the painting itself is going to speed up a little bit as I get really comfortable with the pattern and the, the look. Right now, I'm still looking out for uh, little things that would improve the design. What can I keep? What can I what can I change? And at some point the busyness starts to look better and then I'll I'll appreciate it on that level. And so moving forward just gets to be rote, just do busy work. Um, not not too much in the way of decision making, although I'm always looking out for happy accidents. And um, The, uh, the pattern becomes my own. And yeah, it, it moves a lot, a lot more automatically almost. The reason why it's so important to get to that level where it the busyness starts to work too is that you can start making decisions is like okay this is different than what's there but does it look okay like right now i don't feel like i can judge that yet that's why i bothered putting those holes in and it wasn't even like i drew it poorly i just I had to make a hard choice to shift the cloth. And now my pattern doesn't look like the old pattern. When, um, when my original pattern kind of works, but not completely, Sometimes that can look like the, the pattern shifted a little bit, which I can embrace. Um, so if it gets a tiny bit distorted, you know, the cloth will distort when it, when it is turning instead of like straight down. So all that can work. Now, I'm not going to react to that yet. Again, it's just a matter of filling in more stuff, moving on, moving forward. Not, not overly scrutinizing any one area, but doing the next shape and then the next. And if I have to distort this little section right here, I can lean into that. I can say, OK, well, maybe I want to bend some of these lines right here. Instead of fixing that, I, it might make the painting better. So again, happy accident. Here's another little trick. Liz, can you see anything I'm doing? Liz, can you see anything I'm doing? Hey, I hear myself. Um, <laughs> I can see it mainly on YouTube. Oh, you're watching YouTube? There's like a three second delay between me talking and. Oh, it's because of YouTube. Yeah, there I am. <laughs> That's funny. Sorry, Hans. For what? Okay. So I could see the um, the detail 
on the YouTube better when I than I was there. Yeah, that, that camera is only like a foot away. I'm painting around it right now, which is kind of annoying, but all for the sake of good watching, hopefully. So there, I can hear you now. But um, I was um, watching it on YouTube. It's, it really is cool the way you're doing that. Yeah, I mean, I... I know the system works. I've done it enough times. It takes a little bit of time to look like it has finesse, but you got to start somewhere. And I think that trips up a lot of students is they want the beginning stages to look like the final version too fast. And I, again, it's, it's not like that's not the deal for me. It, of course, you know, like we, we can always get nervous about the beginning stages not looking like it could possibly get to that final version. But a lot of times it does. We just have to work through, you know, problems according to, for one, the consistency of light sources. We don't want to get anything radically different than the color direction and intensity of the light. And then, uh, so that that's worth adjusting and like things like this though this this isn't really that case this is a really like it's not going to look right until it's busy and it's not going to get busy until i add more hatches so it, it's really easy to judge it too soon and i know you just said that you like it and i, I i'm encouraged by the start too i'm just saying like the elegance of the cloth is going to get a lot better when there's less consciously focusing on one small spot, but seeing the busyness of everything all together. Like, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. I was talking about feel before. So now, not only have I developed feel over a long period of time, but I've been developing feel on this painting. Oops, lost it. Um, and so what I mean by that is now I'm getting a better sense of, let's say, where I start the brush stroke, it's nice and bold. And let's say I want it to fade off a little bit as it, it's rolling a little bit. So I can let the brush stroke keep getting weaker and weaker and these lines are going to be there they're going to be a busyness like i said before i really want busyness but they're also going to be um lighter in value and a little less crisp so it's going to feel like it's going to turn just a little bit and again i can make it happen even more with the next sitting with a half paste half paste have to be thoroughly thoroughly the, dry, the painting has to be thoroughly thoroughly dry or else you'll lose all that detail so Again, that's just going to have to be in my mind's eye. I'm going to have to just envision what it's going to look like when I get there. When I sit down on students' artwork, teaching them in person, I have to get a feel for their palette and their color use and the relative colors on the piece itself. And so it usually takes me just a little bit of an adjustment period just to get used to all that. That's what's happening here. So now I'm getting a good sense of where I'm going, like a like a snowball rolling down a mountain. This is going to be an avalanche soon. I'm just going to be hacking away, not thinking, just painting away in automatic mode. <laughs> Speaking of automatic mode, I wasn't paying attention to my black whale. Getting pretty close to the edge. Uh, for all of, all of you who don't know me, uh, I like to paint with black oil. I make it myself. That's this right here. It's basically just cooked oil with lead. It's wonderful. It's a little bit thicker than regular oil. It's got that lead in it. I cook lead into it and it dries sort of fast. It dries slow enough to paint wet into wet for a good eight hour sitting but it's going to be bone dry the next day 
if you get the chance to paint two days in a row, that's huge, especially if you have a two young kids. You never really know if you're going to get two days in a row. And if you can, you really want to be able to. And um, so the black oil is really important in, back when I could paint consistently day after day, whatever. But it's even more now that I never know if I'm going to get two days. I really want to make sure that if I have the chance that I can utilize it. So black oil is really awesome. There's other good products out there. I'm not saying it's a must. I'm just saying I really, really like it. And it used to be that I would take the black oil and turn it into Merge medium. But I had somebody who was painting next to me who can't be around solvents. So we used the solvent free formula, but every once in a while I'd run out of that. And it's, you know, you can't just, I didn't want to say, well, darn, I don't have the right equipment, so I'm not going to paint. So I would just paint with black oil. And I just learned to love it. I just, I like it even better than having those little binders in it of wax or with the massive varnish. So it's still Merge because really black oil is the, the magic the flemish version with the massic varnish mixed with it is really the binder and the wax for the italian version is is the binder so really the magic is the black oil so hopefully nobody with a pedigree of marge's teachings would say betrayer i don't think it's a betrayal again because it's the black oil that's that's the magic I don't think you should blindly follow uh, recommendations anyway. You should see what really works for you. But I wouldn't be naive about it either. Like if you if you just automatically say, well, my materials are the best just because that's what you're used to. I think that's a little short-sighted. So I've really made an effort to paint with a lot of different painting mediums. And I really know the difference. I know what I paint better with. I know what I prefer i know that drying time for me might be more important than for other people and so like i, I just don't want to speak for everybody and say this is the best even though it's my favorite i think my grandmother would have said this is the best just matter of factly but then again she worked on the medium with marge for a long long time <laughs> so as you're watching on YouTube It was because of that sound issue. Why don't you just turn the um, the volume off? If you, you mean on, uh, on the YouTube? if you mute YouTube, it won't have that feedback. Although I didn't mind the feedback. It was like uh, I get to review what I was saying. <laughs> What's that? I couldn't find the button to do that on my phone. Yeah, you've never successfully shut me up, have you? <laughs> you didn't have to go there. Yeah, it's just a joke. when you do start recording if you can oh shoot i did speaking of which i didn't do it yeah. on youtube on zoom you move the camera over just a little so that i could see exactly what you're doing recording in progress all right so the the um the camera my iphone <laughs> is past what i can see it's past where my eyes are okay so I, I didn't know quite what you were looking at no i see i see now okay now i think i think the iphone does a better job picking up details in color than uh the youtube camera and i think well, i just yeah i agree with you there well and you can zoom. yeah well i think i need to buy a better camera i bought one and then i turned it i, I returned it 
And I probably shouldn't have. I probably should have just kept it. Was it not good enough quality? I never really tried it. I just second guessed buying it. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. And I had a little window that I could return it without paying any money. And it's just one of those hindsights being 2020 type thing. I probably should have kept it. How much was it? It was it was inexpensive, but it was it was going to record in full 1080p, which that's what this camera supposedly is, but I don't think it's very good quality. Do you know where your mom got the one at school? Uh, I mean, it'd be a safe guess to say Amazon, but I don't know for sure. Making up a little bit of the pattern right now, and I don't think it's working. I don't know. I'll put a pin in it. We'll see what happens. Again, uh, it's back to that first issue of that. Uh, I shifted the tablecloth, and now I have to make a choice whether to keep everything that is shifted to or keep my old pattern. And it's going to definitely be a little bit of both, but uh, there's a little bit of experimentation to do. Uh, to really know my strategy. And right now, I'm kind of hybriding between the two. And I'm, again, just not 100% sold that it's working in that little area. What I definitely don't want to do is compromise this space too much. And that's part of what's happening now. So I'm going to can this idea of, of these little, if I needed to put these tracks back in, I can just put it in with blue paint. You know, just color match this and then put it in here. I can do it wet into wet. I just have to be careful with my application of paint. So if I put in paint that's substantially, substantially thicker than the wet paint that's already down, It'll sit right on top. Oh, okay. If I go as as thick or thinner, it won't. It will um it'll just mix. No good. Let's see what this does. All right, that can be somewhat of an eraser. Yeah. Okay. Can you see that again? What you just said about? The... Yeah. So here, I'll just do a. I'll speak with paint rather than gobbledygook words. The um, thickness of the paint matters and how it sits on the surface. And I'd have several options to to modify that. But let's just say I have a body of paint down, and I want to keep the strength of that paint then I want to be conscious of making sure that the next brush stroke is thicker or as thick, not thinner, or else um, they'll mix. And which is what you don't want. So I, you want it to sit on top? Yes. Of the, okay, I see what you mean. So I don't, yeah, I don't want to be, I don't want to be thinner than the previous layer or they'll mix. And so that's that's the problem with uh, students have with making mud, is that um, they try to do too much with each trip to the palette. So if I just do single brush strokes, I'm almost guaranteed to be thicker than the previous layer, and it'll sit on top. But I have to be very disciplined to. Um, ah, camera's migrating again. I have to be very disciplined to. Um, Stop and go back to the palette. Okay. And what were you saying before about something seeming like it's like when you were comparing it to the sky holes? Um, there's a new pattern here, and it's all because I shifted the cloth. 
and uh, I was going to try to hybrid between what I'm looking at and um, this new pattern. And it, I can see where it's not quite working the way I want. And so I'm undoing that. Be, mostly because I, I don't want to compromise this space. That space is going to be really cool eventually. I mean, it's got, it's got quite a lot of work to go, but. But you were saying that if you do a certain thing, it would be like putting a sky hole at the end of a tree you know of a uh, yeah so i mean i think anybody who's painted landscape has done this to where they want to put the sky holes into a tree and they put the sky as the you know over top of all those greens it almost feels like the sky is in front of the tree instead of the tree in front of the sky but to avoid that you should do the sky holes first right well i mean if you do the sky if you do the sky first and then paint the leaves over top of it, that'll work perfectly. But that's that's assuming that everything goes right for one or two, that you want to be that technical early on. So the way to get around it is to paint the sky holes pretty generous and then paint the leaves back over the sky hole edges. And then it'll still be the leaves in front of the sky. And it's very subtle, but I think it's, it's worthwhile to consider because, um, I don't know, again, it's all about that first impression again. And even that subtle stuff contributes to the first impression. You may not put your finger on exactly what's going on, but there's a feel. Like you you see the painting and it's a feel. It's like, does that tree look clunky? Because now you've got this heavy handed sky uh, cutting into it. So when you said generous, you mean like thicker paint, right? Um, yeah, well, it's all relative. So right here i don't have to be terribly thick because the painting underneath is dry almost anything is thicker than the previous layer okay and so that's why i've gotten away with like 10 hatches in a row especially when i like the idea that it starts strong and gets a little weaker uh one thing people do that that's definitely problematic is that um when the paint starts running out of when the paint starts running out on the brush then the tendency is to press right and once you press you've made a sloppy mark so um i definitely want to avoid that and again that's a feel thing so i i can definitely feel when i'm running out of paint and i instantly go back to the palette and you just have to earn feel you just can't read it in a book okay but um yeah, so if if I were to start pressing this brush, it would definitely not make a little hatch. It would start making a kind of unpredictable mess. So if I want to predict any brush stroke, not just these tiny little hatches, but like say, uh, you know, a, a broader block in like the basket or something, uh, I still want to be conscious that like on a big filbert brush, like a number six filbert, whatever, if I'm right on the tip, I'm making a line. If I press it all, I'm making a mass. Well, sometimes I'd want a mass and sometimes I'd want a line, but I want to be, I want to do the difference consciously. I don't want to be sloppy with it. Here, it's crucial. Like I don't, I, if I start pressing because the paint started running out of juice, I'm going to make uh, a really sloppy, irreconcilable blob in the middle of this lace tablecloth. And I just want to avoid that. It's an oil painting. I can fix anything in oil. You know, not me. Everybody can fix anything in oil. It's uh, just a matter of layers. And like, say I made a, a really bad mistake in here. I could, you know, paint over it and then paint it again. No problem. I want to definitely try to avoid that because that's very inefficient. The most efficient I can be is to have this block in just simply get elaborated from simple to specific. And that's that's what I really, really, really want. I'm not unrealistic about it because I'm not a perfect painter. 
I don't pretend to be. I have good strategies and I've got decent skills. I have the ability to simplify, but that does. Hey, Malika. But I definitely make bad brush strokes and I definitely try things that just don't work. You know, that's just part of the game. So having to add these sky holes in, it's not that big of a deal. I made sure that whatever I color mixed here was invisible because if, it's, if it color matches so well that it, it, I can't see it, it's going to be fine right there, especially out of context. Now we're just talking about the difference between good and perfect at that point. And, you know, I'm not going to let perfect be the enemy of good. I'm going to keep moving forward. But putting these sky holes in wasn't that big of a deal. So, Malika, you're joining us now. I've been painting for Hello. about an hour, and I've only done like a four inch by four inch square of lace. <laughs> wow. Lots of patience. Well, I've been yammering the whole time, probably just moving my mouth more than making sense, but it's been keeping me sane. A lot of times, when, okay, so not all but one time doing lace tablecloth, I have something going on to entertain me while I do this. And the one exception was that contest in New York where I was doing it as a live contest. Right. Uh, because we were, I mean, we could have put, we, we can put headphones on and stuff like that. Like we didn't really chat that much while we were painting, but um, you know, it was, it was live. That was crazy. Is it harder for you to paint if it's something challenging or is it harder for you to paint if it's something repetitive? Like this, I mean, honestly, when I start these lace, I come in with it with a lot of enthusiasm, like, oh, this is going to be great. And then by the time I get to the middle, I'm like, oh, I'll make it stop. <laughs> and I just got to remind myself that if I, if I get too kind of detached from enjoying the painting, then I might be sloppy. So I have to really concentrate, but still it's mind numbing. And I don't like to numb my mind too much. So yeah, I have to say, it's not one of my favorite subjects, even though I can't prove that because I do it over and over and over again, despite saying I'm never gonna do another lace tablecloth. But, <laughs> but I, you know, at the end product, you can't tell yet, but it, it does start to look impressive. It's, but when everything's in context and I've done a, a few little adjustments, like some half paste and things like that, I, you know, they, they look impressive. It looks really busy and, and refined and all that stuff. So it's a, it's a good subject matter. It's just boring. <laughs> brush stroke a million, brush stroke a million and one. <laughs> Uh huh. In the end, are you gonna fill that with holes too? These are like triple, triple weave little mini dots, but they follow a little track that, if there's any undulation of the clock, they get a little distorted. But they pretty much here. I can do a little section. I wasn't quite ready for it yet, but well, now you don't have to. You can wait. I have to because I can't okay. put it into words what I'm trying to say. Okay. So I have to. So this is like I said, it's like a triple section. I just did four. So I just made a liar on myself. But um, now that one connects to the next one. Right here. And then they have these little verticals that connect. And so the next lace tablecloth won't do this. So each one has its own sense of anatomy. And um, 
That's important for me. If I can figure out the anatomy of the basket or the weave or the shell, then I can I can create my own. I don't have to worry about copying it verbatim. Right. And I definitely don't want to copy this verbatim. It's just way too busy. And that would take forever to feel like I had to get every little hatch in because I don't really know what I'm doing. So I'd rather uh, I'd rather just come up with a scheme that works and um, and make it my own. Right now, but yeah, I can imagine that once you finish, it's, it's going to be different and it's going to have way more detail. But it's really looking good. See, now I can't stop. I wasn't ready for this. <laughs> All right, so these kind of come to the triangular points here again. If I can figure out a system that connects the dots, then I'll just start creating. But that's the, that's why this is the slow part of the slow part. Like the entire lace is the slow part. Right? So even this flat pattern that I put in as just kind of a base for weaving it together, that was pretty slow. That took an, a, just about an entire sitting. I What else did I do? I That was it. That was the whole sitting. You mean last week? Yeah. Well, Saturday. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess it was last week. Yeah, that so that took the whole sitting, and that's just a big flat pattern. No value changes, nothing, just flat. And so um, and this is even slower than that. So there's zero chance that I was going to get this done in a three-hour sitting. Zero. I mean, less than zero. It would be a very foolish bet to think I would do this ala prima. I have done ala prima. <laughs> I have done my Sala Prima. Yeah, it was it was a dumb idea, but it it pulled off okay. What I did was okay, so I cheated a little bit in that I vignetted it out. So like there was a a busy section that kind of did the lacy thing and the rest just kind of faded out to being pretty subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's not call that cheating. Let's call that artistic. <laughs> cheating um and my strategy for all the prima was kind of like this except for i did the base with acrylic okay. and so it would be thoroughly dry so i can put these little hatches on without worrying about wet into wet oh, okay. and um so like i said with these little holes that i put in i relegated that to one brush stroke per trip to the palette because I had to make sure that this brush didn't run out of paint and then it would just start mixing because it'd be weaker paint than the previous layer. Now I'd just be making blue, like hazy blue dots instead of feeling like that's the color that's reading through all these little openings. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I, again, it's not like it's the end of the world. I could fix it with little glazes and things like that. But then what's the likelihood that it's going to perfectly color match? Well, I could either take a lot of time to do that or it'd just be a little off, maybe even enough to be annoying. So single brush strokes there. If I had to do these little hatches on top of the table and that little hazy thing behind it and that black opening, my goodness, this would take forever because I wouldn't have that dry base to put these little tiny hatches on. This, almost anything I put on top of this dry painting is, I mean, this is by default gonna be thicker than that previous layer. I mean, it would just have to be. So um, the better strategy is to have a thoroughly dry base. And that's what I did with the acrylic. Oh, yeah, that's smart. Very smart. Just think, I could have made money in a lucrative job doing smart things. <laughs> well, anyone can do a job. <laughs> I can't paint a leg. 
That's right. I can show how talented and poor, talented and poor I am. <laughs> no complaints. I love this stuff. I'm just, I'm just being a smart ass. So anyway, I didn't think I was going to get into that now. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a break on that. Let me just do a little section where I connect it and then it'll make more sense. So like these little hatches have a little like lace connector here. And I feel like that's too big. So I feel like I, I rushed this just a little bit, but I'm gonna problem solve real quick. I'm gonna make each one just a tiny bit bigger and that's gonna close down that distance. So again, it, you know, there, you either have to design everything ahead of time and measure everything or trace or whatever. Again, I, I, I'm not gonna stigmatize anybody that traces, but, um, there are ways that you could make this to where you could, you know, not have to problem solve so much. I think part of the joy of painting is in this sort of cruel puzzle that you do have to problem solve. You do have to figure things out. And at the end product, a lot of it gets to be a little bit more creative than if everything was perfectly planned and you're just following the, you know, strict mandate from start to finish. I don't know. I enjoy this process a lot more, even though it can be frustrating. But then again, I problem solve a lot more than other artists. Probably less than others, but still problem solving is a major part of my simple to specific approach, that abstract to realistic approach. Very much um, part of the way I think and do. So, um, now you can see just like this little bridge and i wanted to make it a little smaller because i thought that looked just maybe a little bit too prominent so again just a little bit of a problem solve and then this might need a little connector so i can look up there and see if there's an example of the pattern getting a little off and since I don't really see it, I could make it up or I could extend this down and then connect it. Connect and then make this bigger. And there, so that's starting to Starting to come along. I feel like there's another little problem solved to do with this. This seems a little off as far as the size of those holes. But again, once I once I get my system down, this is going to really start cooking. But I I'm figuring that as I, as I go. All right. Uh, and Malika, you didn't see at the beginning, I had, uh, I mixed up this big old pile of paint. It's not white, just looks bright in context. Really? Yeah, no, it's darker than white. Yeah, I want to preserve white. I don't want pure white on this down plane, for one. And I'm going to preserve pure white for the brightest parts of the shells. So I don't want it in the lace. The top plane of the tablecloth is brighter than this side plane. So I definitely don't want to use white for that purpose too. Okay. And um, that's partly why this base value that I put down is fairly dark so that I don't have to be terribly bright to make it read as contrast. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, you know, from cast drawing, everything's relative. It, those yeah. reflected lights only look bright because they're surrounded by darks. Right. And if you make them too bright, then you've told the wrong story of the light.
I think, yeah, I can see that you probably, so yeah, I can see that you had to mix the paint because that's why it's giving the effect of the table of the cloth having folds. Yeah, well, I wanted to shift a little bit. Uh, one thing I didn't anticipate, and I, I guess you didn't hear a lot of the grousing I did earlier, was that um, when I made that decision at the end of the last sitting to shift the tablecloth, this pattern right here is radically different than the way I've locked it in. So I, I shifted it because the table, the table can't sit cleanly on the table. I mean, the cloth can't sit cleanly on the table because there's these little cleats that hold the bookshelf to the wall. And so instead of dangling out of the other side, it's bunching up and it stopped this from hanging very, uh, you know, straight across. Right. And that really bothered me in the way that the tablecloth was growing and I was losing, I was losing my negative shapes on the bottom, which I declared from the beginning were really something that was important to me. And so um, now I'm kind of reaping the consequences of that here in that I have to kind of make up the shapes a little bit. You know, I can follow some things and I have to, to problem solve the others because my blocking doesn't correspond to what I'm looking at. And that's, uh, you know, it's just part of the, again, it's part of the game. Uh, the, I think my, was it my first? No, that that big one, the one with the gourds on top, right. that shifted a lot. Uh, the cats would jump on it. <laughs> and like every time I came down, it was in a slightly different spot. They even knocked over one of the gourds and broke it, but the gourds were already done when I, by the time I was doing the lace. It didn't really matter. <laughs> No, it was, I guess it, yeah, I mean it was a it was a previous batch of cats. They were they're all deceased now, but oh, sorry. <laughs> not not because they disturbed my lace tablecloth. Let's make that clear. <laughs> that was not their punishment. Uh, they they didn't get punished at all. <laughs> But yeah, it was uh, mostly the little little orange cat Baxter and Seymour. They're both gone now. So this is going pretty well. The um, when, when you're starting the beginning shapes, unless you have it, again, like perfectly planned out, which I've, I've kind of already iterated that I don't really like to paint that way. Um, there's going to be some a little bit of problem solving to do. But like I said, this, is, this I think is going well, and I don't want to judge it until I get more. So I'm just going to keep moving forward. Even there's, if there's something about it that, you know, maybe I don't like perfectly yet. It'll be so much easier to fix on a dry painting for one. And for two, um, it probably will work better than I think it's working when I get more. And so busy patterns are like that. Uh, part of describing it as busy is already acknowledging that it needs that busyness to look like what it's, what it's going to end up looking like. And so um, I'm going to hold out on on doing major adjustments. So just like I mentioned before about having a dry painting, um, before I start putting hatches in here, this pattern wasn't here before, but now it is. And I can put this in really cleanly on a dry surface rather than trying to go over the white. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that in earlier. Like that was a, I mean, it looks fine but I don't have to be as conscious of the thickness of the paint on the tip of this tiny little brush, which hardly holds any paint at all. 
It makes it a lot easier if I just do it now instead of later. So me jumping around a lot is part of the way I paint too. I don't like to just keep droning on from one area because it's really easy to lose track of where it's going. And so I like to build things up as a whole and bouncing around helps for that. So I was working here and now I'm working here and now I'm working here. That's, that's part of the way I like to paint. This I stayed away from because I'm going to turn that into a shadow. I could, I could just put it in and then glaze it later. I'll just put a pin in that. I'll, I'll get to that later. The one concern about working with the blue and the brown is that I have to be careful not to forget which hand, brush is in my hand. Which sounds like, why would you, why would you use the wrong brush? I do it all the time, so I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna say it's a good thing, and I'm not even gonna say that it's not embarrassing. But you can forget which one, and then all of a sudden I'll make this sort of weird blue hazy mark in the middle of my lace, and then I'll have to suppress all the cuss words and the anger and the. <laughs> It, it's happened. That's why I bring it up. If I had two brushes in my hand and I'm just not conscious of which one I'm about to make the brush stroke with. So I just put those other two brushes down. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when it really happens the most is when I'm doing the, the block in sitting with Umber and I forget which brush is my eraser. Not a big deal. It'd be a big deal in this painting. So I just put those other brushes aside. Again, I don't I don't have to mention those things. I just like to. <laughs> My pattern is getting a tiny, tiny bit off right there. I have to decide what to do about it. I think what I'm going to do is just take this gray and get rid of that line. That line just doesn't work. And that's the nice part of having that previous gray mix. I just painted right over it. Now I have to be conscious of that wet on wet thing and limit my brush strokes, but it was totally worth it. I just have that problem solved in my bag of tricks. Well, that's good. That's part of the intention. Yeah, it's working. Some things are a little heavy handed and I don't think those shadows are dark enough. And like I said, I just don't want to deal with that right now. So I'm going to paint it with the darkness of those shadows in my mind's eye and not be simultaneously working worried about too many values. I'm gonna worry about more than just the drawing right now. And um, it's so much nicer if I don't have to worry about too many things simultaneously. All right, so there's some darks in here again. I've got a dry painting. So I'm gonna just get out that blue again. And that's where, you know, this would happen anyway, but uh, to a lesser extent that my my pattern of the holes, I carefully tracked out. I was really generous with the tracks. I painted them a little too big so that I could cut in with fresh paint for these little sharp edges. But uh, with the pattern changing and still too early on to just ad lib, it's worth painting these in. So much nicer to paint them in on a dry surface. So I want to do that now before I put those little white hatches around them. And again, just little little problem solves that I've developed over time. Let's 
So, ah, I just did it. Just what I was talking about. Just mixed my white brush into the blue paint. Oh no. Yeah, it was bound to happen. I, I almost willed it into, into uh, existence by me just talking about it. It's okay. I told Liz that I bought like a hundred pack of these cheapo brushes that have rather nice points. Like obviously, you know, those, I mean, I think the world of rosemary brushes, I, I just, you know, the detail brushes, they, they burn out so fast yeah. that I went a different strategy and I just bought a bunch of cheapo, uh, brushes with nice points. And, uh, it's it, the system's working fine. Like if I had to pitch this, it's like fifty cents. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, from from your, I can see that they are making perfect marks for the plate. So. Yeah. So again, I mean, I, no disrespect to really high quality paintbrush makers like like Rosemary or you know Robert Simmons or you know whatever uh, Windsor Newtons with their. Uh, you know, Monarch brushes. I really like Monarch, the synthetic mongoose. That's it. We were talking about that in class today, Liz. Or maybe it was yesterday or something. Remember when we said um, that we said, oh, that would totally make a good rock band name? And we looked it up and it really was one. Oh, yeah. It was synthetic mongoose. And I knew, I knew I'd remember it at a really weird time. Oh, so that's it. That's, wow. Yeah, Synthetic Mongoose. That's the name of a band. It is the name of a band. That's crazy. And I was just joking, saying that would be a funny name for a band. And uh, somebody looked it up. Karen, yeah, that makes sense. Somebody, somebody will make sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, somebody. Yep. Synthetic mongoose. Cool. And my prophecy came true. I'd remember it at a really weird time. No, what I what I intended by saying that was like I'd be in the middle of my car ride home and just scream it out to absolutely nobody. Synthetic Magos. <laughs> it would be funny if you just uh, shout out a couple of random numbers that come to your mind, and you know you win the lotto. Oh, that would be good. Uh, especially the winning the lotto part. <laughs> Bit of a mistake there. That's okay. Anyway, I'm going to do this little section because I'm, I'm even boring myself doing this. I can't imagine watching somebody doing this, but then I'll look at, I'll look at the clock and possibly get to, I uh, just assuage how much time, right? If I have to do like, I'm not going to do the dots if I don't have hour, like over an hour to do the urchin shell, but I could tweak something with a little bit of time. So I'm just going to, I'm going to just going to look at the clock and decide what I can get away with without. How late do you plan to go tonight, you say? Well, I usually plan for three hours. Okay. I don't, I don't necessarily have to stick to that. I haven't been sleeping great, so probably good not to be up till two, which 
like 11. It's possible. Okay. Yeah, that's usually not particularly late for me. But... You started at 7.30 there, right? I did. Yeah, well, how about 10.30? Way early. Well, I mean, 10... Okay, so as a benchmark, 10.30, it could be the goal, and then it almost always spills over. So, like, if I'm in the middle of a moment, I don't want to be so bound to 10.30 that I have to put the brush down. And so I, I try to, yeah, I try to plan it so that the timing I plan for is a little short of what it needs to be. I don't know. It seems like so far away. So we'll, I'll make up my mind by the time I get to a, a nice stopping point for the corner of the lace. And like I said, I'm going to record every brushstroke from start to finish. So far, so good. Every brushstroke has been recorded. But no, no exception for the lace. It's just going to be whether they're live sittings or not. And so I don't, I really don't like it when demos, you know, skip a whole crucial section and all of a sudden it goes from rough to like really accurate and refined. It's like, well, wait a minute. What happened in between? You know. Oh, yeah, I speak from experience. So <laughs> they, uh, yeah, that bothers me. So I, I definitely don't want that for my videos. So I like it, even if I have to speed it up big time, like not, you know, 20 hours of little tiny hatches. Nobody really wants to watch that live. I, I, I can't be entertaining for that long. <laughs> You'll hear some really out there rambling if I had to paint live for 20 something hours of tiny little hatches of white paint or off white paint. So I don't think that should be live. Maybe I tell you what, since this is way out of context, what I'll do is when I get to the last little section, maybe I'll do it again, like live. Again, all of it's going to be recorded, and I'm not going to skip a thing. But it's just a matter of if I'm going to have people watching live, uh, we'll we'll skip the live part for the whole middle block in. I'll try to reserve. You know what I'll do? I'll try to reserve Saturdays for live. I just I'll just pick different days for doing the block into the lace, and then and then you can see it progress in just little chunks. Yep, a plan is forming right before our ears. All of this is shadow and I'm painting around it. It doesn't look like shadow yet. Uh, so I blocked in the previous sitting to the value that's kind of in between all the little hatches, but it's not dark enough to be shadow. So uh, that I could glaze on this sitting, but I'd already have to be painting around these little white hatches. So it, it's just for the sake of, I don't have to do it right now. I'm going to leave it and it'll be a nice dry painting when I glaze those shadows in. And so that's another like in, in painting decision. So all of this in here is shadow, all of this in here is shadow, and a lot of this pattern in here is shadow. So if you see where the, I stopped doing brush strokes, I intended to put that in, and then I changed my mind. It's just not worth it. it there's just no need to do it now. So um, I'm not. Especially not with simultaneously trying to change the pattern that I see. Yeah, to metal with, sh with shadows and exactly where I put paint and where I haven't. Yeah, definitely not worth it. Do you think the busyness of the lace would also take away from the still life focal point? I don't think so. I think it'll, I, okay. So the way it's worked in the past is the busyness is important, but 
it makes it so that not any one little hatch or one little section of hatches is that noticeable because it all blends in together. So this will look like a cohesive hole. It'll just have texture. And this entire painting is going to be busy. It'll just kind of fit in with a network of busyness. So if I step back and it's not telling the right story of where I want the eye to go, then that'll just be some simple glazes to, to maybe subdue the cloth just a little bit or to uh, elevate a shell over some other areas. And uh, that's going to be almost every painting to where you just got to have to wait and see what what you can see with that kind of first impression. Right now, I've been mired in a little section. I almost always encourage getting back from the work from, you know, in maybe 20 minute intervals. But in this, there's just a lot of busy building to do. And um, I can I can just look over at the screen and see it from a distance. <laughs> so that's good enough. <laughs> Cheater. Yeah, I do that on Fridays now too. It's like I'll have YouTube going on the figure model and I, I can't get back from the work in that corner. So I'll just look over the YouTube screen. It's like, okay, yeah, it's a little distorted. Oh, that's why you look at, oh, I see. It's a little distorted, but it still gives me that step back look. Instagram and I did see you look back and I was thinking is he checking if Instagram's still working well there's that Instagram fails on me a lot at that art school so that there's that too and Kyle and I have a little brainstorming session about what we can do about it yeah. that Instagram cuts out like last time was ridiculous that cut out like six times yeah that was a record I was so frustrated with that. Yeah, it is frustrating. It's very frustrating. That used to be the only way I was uh, going live was Instagram. And I would just lose everybody. And sometimes they come back and it would go from like having, I don't know, 30 something people to having 10 to having five to ending up with like three. Every time it cut out, I'd lose more people. And I don't blame them. I, I you know. I'd get on to something else too. <laughs> so is YouTube um, more reliable then? Um, I don't, I don't know exactly why. Um, the, yeah, the short answer is yes, but I don't know exactly why. I don't know if it's because I've been doing YouTube on the computer as opposed to the phone, but I, you know, I think the, the computer's higher, you know, more sophisticated technology than my laptop. So I wouldn't think so, but I can't rule it out. I don't know. I don't, I don't truly know what the answer is. I think, um, you know, I noticed that on YouTube, you were able to have the photo of the setup and the um you know the video so how did you figure that out the photo and the video what are you talking about on youtube the advertisement no no i noticed that you had the setup of your item you know your setup and then you also had your painting i don't know what you're talking i okay. i'm a little lost Never mind. Okay, I think it's just the way your camera is that you can see both. Oh, okay. You're talking about the feed. Yeah. So 
I mean, this isn't ideal. I'm kind of squeezing myself in between two cameras while I'm doing this. I know. I, know well, you are. I mean, my range of motion is tiny for this little section anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. But it's not ideal. Like I, I'm painting around cameras instead of having them a little further back where I have the space to work. But it, yeah, again, it's okay. But yeah, with this position of the camera, the still life is at least a little bit in the shot. Especially on YouTube. Yeah, I wouldn't think so on Instagram because Instagram's on the or Zoom because Zoom is on the other side of me. It's it's to my right. Yeah, but I can still see the setup a little bit, and also I have I have a picture of the setup. Good, good, good. Yeah, I. I should probably set up a little earlier and get the cameras just right and set up so that you can look at the uh, image of the still life side by side with the painting and all that stuff. Sometimes I feel like that's a little unfair in that I'm creating a painting. I'm not painting faithfully to the lace, so I don't really like that comparison. It's really not about every little stitch and every little hole being in the same position. It's just creating a system that makes sense. Right. So yeah, it might be more enjoyable for the viewer to, to have uh, the setup side by side while I'm painting. Well, they, they do have it when you see it on YouTube. You yeah, on YouTube on this position, yeah. Uh, and like I said, I'm painting around the camera right now. But that's okay. I put big warnings on the YouTube feed or no on Zoom or on the Instagram talking about Zoom. I said, warning, painting lace, refining lace is slow and boring. <laughs> It's in the body of the text. In big, bold, capital letters. <laughs> Lace. <laughs> I'm warning people not to expect to be entertained here. <laughs> Watch at your own peril. You've been forewarned. <laughs> I didn't get those cats today, Liz. Uh, I, used, I, I got in the car and I started to leave and then I just, I talked myself out of it. Uh, I still might. It's just, I was thinking about it. It's like, you know, I should probably clean my basement just a little bit more, make sure there's no toxic chemicals that cats could get into or whatever. And I'm not, I'm still not fully sold that it's a good idea. I love, I love having cats in here, but it's, uh, I don't know. The other thing I thought of is like, what if they jump on my still life setup and break these shells? Oh yeah, that would not be good. I can't have a dog, not unless I brought it into the school four days a week. Oh, yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, cats are more independent dogs. Not so much. Not so much. Yeah. I mean, traditionally, I've always been more of a dog person, but I really enjoy cats, too. They're good for your blood pressure. Cats are? <laughs> Jeez. What did you say, Malika? I was asking you, you said cats or any kind of pet? Oh, I think any kind of pets, but mainly cats, I think. Oh, okay. But they are so, um, I don't know, they're so um, mellow. 
I mean, when they're cats, not when they're kittens. <laughs> Yeah, they're cute. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what I'll do? Yeah, I know. I know the timing isn't very good for dogs right now. But. Yeah, your kids are young. I think once they're old enough, probably they'll you guys you guys will have lots more fun with dogs. Dogs are a lot of work too. They are. My last dog, I couldn't take to my. The, my apartment when I moved out of Baltimore. So it kind of, she kind of became mom's dog, but Camille, the Husky, she was a great dog. Not a well-behaved dog, not a very obedient dog, but still very quantifiably smart. She was very clever. Kind of had a chatty way of talking. It was like this. Rawr, 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 rawr. <laughs> it's really cute. That's cute. I'm making some dog is beautiful. Have I seen your dog, Malika? Huh? Have I seen your dog? Have you shown me pictures? Am I just forgetting? I, I just couldn't. Oh, the like golden or like the lab, not golden. A lab? Okay. I'm trying to remember the photo. Yeah, a la uh, golden. I had a golden for many, many years. Sweet, lovable dog. Was that Woofy? Woofy, yeah. Woofy, Woofy the dog. We rescued him from one of my swim meets in Texas. I, I used to do competitive swimming. And um, he was swimming in the practice pool and couldn't get out. And so we, so we rescued him. And it was in the middle of just like this outrageous downpour, like a whiteout. And so we took him home. And, you know, we put all the flyers out. It's like missing dog. You know, nobody claimed him. So he became our dog. But it was funny. I mean, he lived, uh, he lived to 17. He had a great life. Uh, yeah. But um, for a golden, that's, that's a really long life. But yeah. the, uh, the funny thing is the first thing he did when he ran into our house, there was a painting my grandmother did of my mother as a teenager with a dog. And Woofy came into the house for the first time, ran over to that portrait and started barking at the dog. Started barking at the portrait. It's like, we have an art connoisseur on our hands. <laughs> wow. I think you're selling that dog in the painting that I am the new pet. Of yeah. The yeah. You very still dog that's hanging on a wall <laughs> not gonna over inflate his intelligence too much <laughs> he was kind of the big dumb lummox type but uh yeah he was a great dog when i first came to the school i thought schuler was your dog you know like that uh, i thought he lived there he was a sweet dog we would have uh, we did entertain taking him. He already got adopted by the time we made up our mind. Oh, you mean after Jim died? Yeah. Yeah. He has a really good home, I think. No, that's great. No, we're really happy that he, he uh, you know, he's, he's being loved and he has his little kids and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, let me know when you become a cat owner. <laughs> If. <laughs> Are you looking at some rescue cats? Yeah, I went to like there's a local pet smart and a pet co, and there's some cute cats there. But they had a little Valentine's special to where they were gonna wave all the. Fees except for fourteen dollars. Okay. 
but when I went there, nobody like the store in the in the rescue center aren't the same. Like so technically those cats are in the store, but they're not it's not the store's responsibility. Okay. So the store themselves, they can't they can't handle the adoption. And so there were the people that were supposed to be there weren't there. So I don't know. I took that as kind of like a sign. <laughs> then I could truthfully tell them, look, I tried, didn't happen. <laughs> I don't lie to my boys. But that doesn't mean they have to know every little detail. <laughs> Yeah, I still haven't fully resolved the idea. I don't know. I mean, you're still, you're, you entertained it, and I think that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Well. I believe that's going into your life, and it's meant to be. Yep. Well, the cats we used to have, I mean, they just kind of all fell into our laps. They didn't, we didn't go looking for them. They found us. So that's exactly what you just said. I think it's the same with people. Yeah, that's true. All right, so. Uh, I'm starting to feel like it's rolling toward these little shadow pockets, even though I can't see the shadows yet. The one thing I don't think is working is that vertical line right there. I'm probably going to get rid of that before the end of the sitting. Um, I think as a new strategy, I'm going to get, I'm not going to do the vertical lines, even though they're very crucial, because I feel like they'd be better to put on top without worrying about correcting them wet into wet if they don't perfectly do the undulation of the cloth because like i said the the undulation of the cloth sometimes is a plan and sometimes it just kind of happens that the pattern gets distorted a little bit and i can make it work by turning the cloth and so uh, i want to be able to reserve that idea and um I'm going to change my strategy just a little bit and not do the verticals on this sitting for the rest of it and just get rid of the ones that don't work and keep the rest. So are you saying that you're going to let it dry and then you're going to do it when, once it's dry? I mean, I could just do it right now. The um, This line right here, the movement of the cloth value-wise isn't supported by the straight line of this little vertical. So I'm going to get rid of it. It's a distraction. It's amazing how you can see that. Because I wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah. I mean, like, there's a big difference being able to see this in real life than it is on camera. I'm, I'm sure that's part of the reason. But partly, too, is, you know, the way I try to interpret things artistically is more about the light than it is the objects. Yeah, that's true. And right now with the light, it wasn't working to describe volume. It wasn't it working to describe that the cloth is turning? Okay. It wouldn't, it probably wouldn't have mattered for that oh so crucial first impression of the viewer. And you know, yeah, sometimes you fix it and sometimes you don't, right? If if it works from that first impression, then you leave it alone. But uh, the problem is I don't have enough of the cloth yet to decide that. So as I get more into the painting, when I get to tiny little gray slash number five million and 45, then, then I'll be able to decide better whether something that I didn't plan is working okay or not. But 
right now, probably just better to get rid of that vertical track that didn't work. So, So I'm just trying to communicate some of the thoughts I'm having. And none of them are to say that it's not working. It's just to say that there's little strategy shifts and little things that I'm starting to pick up now that more of the painting is in place. And then this idea that it's going to look even radically different the more the lace that gets blocked in and the more it all gets relative to each other. And so, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. And see where numbing out to like a movie really helps with something like this. But I'm I'm enjoying talking to you. I, I don't wanna suggest that I'm not entertained. Yeah, I'm the conversation too, but um this is very uh, educational too because um I've always wondered how you paint the laces and I can see that it's uh, a lot of hard work. Yeah. Uh Okay, yeah, the beginning is hard because you're figuring out patterns and you're figuring out how to make it work. And it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's it's kind of reacting to the painting and it's, uh, you know, just getting used to it. Then it, it, it gets to be less of a, you know, difficulty and more of just a busyness. But that busyness is hard because it gets monotonous. It's like... You do a ton of brush strokes and feel like you've gotten no further. Yeah. And it's not entertaining. And so it it's kind of like a little war of attrition here. It's it's can you can you do this long enough and not get sloppy? Um that's been the battle of the paintings of the past. So again, the beginning is a lot of concentration. You're trying to get a system that works. You're trying to understand the anatomy. You're getting a feel for all those little hatches. And um, then it's just a matter of putting enough to make it make sense. And uh, yeah, it's definitely an arduous project process. So I, I'm looking forward to getting back to the shells now. So maybe it had its purpose there too. <laughs> it's like no, I can't wait to get back to shells because <laughs> because I've just done you know a hundred thousand little tiny brush strokes. But I I contrast this to more of just like a busy texture than I would call detail. Detail to me is a lot more intentional. This is just adding kind of a system of, of little hatches to make it look like um, lace tablecloth, but I, I have zero concern about whether I have the right thread count or anything. Like detail to me is a lot more intentional. Like these little transverse lines on the, the basket are detail or these little dots on the urchin shell. That to me is more detail than the cloth. Okay, so now it, you are saying that you have to plan details more. Uh, well, I mean, you have to be more intentional. Yeah. Like if I'm putting eyelashes on my, you know, portrait, I don't want to just slop little curvy lines on there. They want I wanted to show the right system of 
of curls. I want them to, to wrap around the form. I want them to catch the right kind of light. This, I'm just kind of mindlessly putting in, not mindlessly, but a lot of those hatches are just to add uh, more texture, not, not to add detail. I mean, it's just, I'm just, I'm trying to define the word with a word with the same word that doesn't ever work, but um, these aren't as intentional. I do want them to curve. I do want them to be about the same thickness. So that counts, but there, it's less of an intentionality. I mean, I've already described it, but the, the thing that makes this sitting really hard is that the cloth moved and that my blocking pattern doesn't match what I'm looking at. And you have no cats to blame. Nope. <laughs> nope. I have myself to blame. No, but I made a really conscious decision. I still feel like it was the right one. It just made this sitting difficult. All right, so again, this area is incomplete just simply because I'm going to glaze the shadow into it when it's dry. Same thing with right here and right here. So I'm just leaving that incomplete for right now. I'm going to continue out this little webbing until I get to the next pattern. And then I'm going to call it for the lace tonight. And I'll do a lot more of the block in, or a lot more of this weaving. Um, recorded but not live until I get to the very end and then I'll go back to live and then you'll see it a lot differently because even though I'll be doing kind of the same thing with just a little bit more awareness of what's going on with the painting but um also too is that I, again that, that texture just kind of feeds off of itself and that busyness just kind of contributes to a whole cloth rather than this section of little tiny hatches. So I think that'll make a little bit more sense when I get there, but that's that's what I'm talking about in a nutshell. Okay. I don't know how visible these little lines are. When I looked at the pattern, it looked like a kind of like a checkerboard tablecloth pattern. Really? Yeah. When I looked at the pattern, on the um, on the setup, yeah. That area looks a little bit like a checkerboard um, tablecloth. Oh yeah. Yeah. So just like before, until I get a little bit more familiar with it, I have to come back and adjust some of these shapes. They didn't quite work. They're not consistent enough, but they will be again once I start getting into the flow of things. At least, again, that's just always the way it's worked out in the past. I just don't want them to get radically bigger as they get out. So while this is wet, I do have the option of erasing or I have the, the option of grabbing the brown and fixing it that way. So right here doesn't work. Not, not enough. I just want to problem solve my way through it. 
And like I said, the next time I do that, the next row will make a little bit more sense. And then the next row will make a little bit more sense. All until I'm not even thinking about it anymore. So it's all going to fall into place. So I'm just going to problem solve through this, this little moment. Again, just mixing up that brown again, making sure it color matches. That's a little dark. It's still a little dark. Better. Such subtle little touches. True, but uh, I feel like it's worth it because, again, just trying to get down that system. Because as soon as I get the system down, then it's going to be very automatic. It's just going to be my own pattern. And I can adapt just because I'll, I'll build so much familiarity with it. I'll understand the anatomy. I'll understand the light. And so that's what made it worth fixing. It's not like anybody would really notice, or if they did, I could still fix it on the next sitting, or uh, I'd probably get away with it because there's just so much to look at in this painting anyway. But to me, it's worth it just just to keep building that familiarity and really scrutinize what I'm doing early on. I feel like they're getting a little bit big too, but if they're consistently big, that'll, that might work. In fact, I think they are bigger than these holes anyway. Even if they are, the the next the follow up question of that is, would it, does it look right to the viewer? Even if it would be pretty accurate to the uh, cloth, and so that that's a concern for mine too, um, of just making sure that it my first impression makes sense to the viewer. I'm trying this a slightly different way. Okay, let's see if that works better. part of that adaptation. Working okay. Wondering if the holes are getting even bigger. I think they are. Yeah, I think they're getting too big. Not sure that works. And now I gotta be really careful. Worth a shot. And it could have been the fine system and poor execution. You always got to be mindful of that. The beauty of having a dry painting underneath all this busy stuff. And just wipe it right away. Now, I, I could have definitely gotten sloppy with that and lost too much and created this hazy mess. So I wanted to be really careful. 
Um, but so far, so good. That wiped off pretty clean. And now I'm trying the same system, but less of an opening. I wanted to give the system another chance. Again, I suspected maybe it was just human error rather than a bad design. Now the, now the slashes are getting big. I'm just painting sloppy right now. Okay. Just as I was saying before, if, if you put down a single brush stroke, it goes down as a really bold brush stroke. I'm just fanning this out for the exact opposite effect. Now it's super weak paint. It's just a, a, essentially a glaze. And again, that's just all a feel that you can develop over time. What's the paint load? How do you feel that the paint is running out of the off of the brush without making one too many brush strokes? Or how do you problem solve if you put down a brush stroke that was too kind of thick and bold? And you definitely don't have to panic, you just spread it out. Now that doesn't it does. Never mind. inconsistencies I'm scrutinizing this just a little bit more than the rest the rest already had more of a design this is just big empty space so there's a little bit more to figure out as I go getting the scale right getting the anatomy of the weave right and by right, I mean consistent, not necessarily exactly like the lace. So I feel like they're all getting way too big. Way too big. All right, so I'm going to do it again. I'm just going to get rid of it. Remember I said in the beginning that I wasn't quite ready for this section? That, this yeah. is why. It's because... Uh, a little trickier than what I was doing pretty previously. Takes more concentration. And I didn't like the way it was going. And here I am up undoing it. It just got to be a scale that didn't really mesh with the rest of the weave. I might have to glaze that section just because uh, there might be a cloudiness now, almost like a half paste. It's okay. All of it's okay. Nothing to panic about. I thought it was still good to see how you approached it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing it. just going to do it with more wisdom now. So none of that was a loss. And when I say figure it out, that, you know, should imply that there was a little bit of, you know, a little bit of ignorance as to how to pull it off. And um, I tried something and it didn't quite work. And that's okay. So hopefully when I come back in, I won't make the same mistake. Ten o'clock. I have a feeling that it'll be eleven by the time I finish this little section. 
so this might be it. I was hoping I might be able to get to another section. So hopefully that didn't come across as a promise. <laughs> Just takes what it takes. No, it's hard to anticipate how long this is going to take. I thought what you might do was to, um, you know, after you wiped it out, to work on another section and then do that next week, maybe. I could, but uh, this is fresh on my mind, how to problem solve. Yeah. So I didn't want to lose that momentum. I'm not really that frustrated. Again, okay. just I, you know, I'm figuring it out. I mean, that, that's exactly what. that happens when you're figuring things out. You just don't have it worked out yet. You, you're bound to make a mistake or not. A mis again, not a mistake. Just you tried something that didn't work. Now it's trying to do something. Hopefully that'll work better, but I'll still be looking out for if this system doesn't work too well. And if it doesn't, then that's okay too. It's just not a section that I want. I, there are some things in the painting that if it dried with a little bit of a mistake, that'd be fine, but not here because I want to preserve the, the richness of the dark underneath. Yeah. And again, it's not that I can't problem solve through that. It's just that it'd be better not to have to. What I don't want to be hypocritical on is this idea that it will look better the more I do. But I, I'm still not fully sold on the size of the openings and the size of the weave. So. Now I'm going smaller and a little tighter to the other row. And I think third time's a charm. Yeah, I don't like to hide from that stuff. I make decisions that don't always work. Um, you know. This is pretty intricate and it's not automatic yet. Like I said, when it, by the time I get halfway into the pattern, I won't even be thinking anymore. It'll just be working. I say that about anatomy a lot to where when you learn it really well, you don't have to, you know, rack your brain as to the origin and termination and morphology of the muscles and bones. You can just look at it and say, okay, that looks like a proper foreshortening and that looks wrong. And this proportion doesn't match with that proportion, you know, just gets to be a sense. This I'm learning the anatomy as I go. I tried some things that or probably a combination of a strategy that didn't work and a little bit of, you know, not putting the marks in the right spot. Liz and Malika, did you guys get the, um, that PDF of, Sergeant's technique? Um, I think something was posted on Facebook Shooter's student site about his use of limited palette. Is that the one? No, it wasn't about his limited palette. It was about his okay. his methods. And it, it, it talked about how he would do whole sections and then wipe them out and do it again and then wipe it out again and do it again. Like over and over until he liked it. And all you see is that there's really expressive brush strokes 
And it just looks like he just kind of coughed it right onto the canvas in perfect talent and master mastery. But according to that, it's not true. He also talked about the painting with, um, was it the fireflies and the children? With those lanterns? Yeah. Yeah, that took like three years. Yeah, I think he was saying the kids kind of grew up. Yeah, the kids stopped being a good model for that painting. <laughs> yeah. I have That's to read funny. I have to read it again because it was it was a good read. It's very yeah. informative. I have the PDF right right on my Google Drive. I can share it with you. I was gonna ask you also. I know you gave me that um stuff on color theory with group A. Yeah. But I can't find it. I was but you lost it. <laughs> what? But you uh, lost it. That's all good. Yeah. I, I can lost it. I can send it again. I was gonna ask Jan to send it to me, but I forgot that. You know, what we could do is just another dedicated class to color theory. You can get super technical with it. I've got a DVD that maybe we can review if it's not too long. Uh, it's from Gamblin. Um, but very technical. You know, it talks about the difference between subtractive and additive color. And it talks about like the color wheel and all that. I, I don't get that technical. It's just too much to think about for something that I feel is a little bit more intuitive. Um, because I've seen, I've been equally impressed by paintings that are very demure in color and paintings that are just wild in color. And really at the end of the day, it's about the system of the light rather than the actual colors. Cause just flooding pure color everywhere doesn't work. But if, if you can feel like the light does this to the object and it's not doing that same thing to the shadow, then then it can work. So that's what I focus more on with uh, color theory. So I, I don't have a particularly generous palette or a particularly limited palette. It's kind of like right in the middle. But like when I entertained the idea of going to studio and Caminati, they made everybody in the studio use the same palette of like 30 pigments, 32 or something like that, 36. And it was, it's almost like you had so many colors on there, you didn't have to mix. And I don't know, I, I think it's much better to have a more limited palette and mix, but I also don't like that to have like only earth tones. I like to have a little bit of, of rich color in there too. So it's just kind of like right in between, nothing radical. It's kind of like a standard palette, but the way I set up the palette is really important, and that's along color theory lines. But do you put um, pad red medium on your palette? That's that's kind of a more recent thing. I used to only have cad red light, but I just felt like uh, cad red light was a little too orangey. Tomatoes. Well, why don't we just call it cadmium tomato? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they have cadmium lemon, right? Yeah. Oh, you mean, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Silly joke. Uh, okay, so that, that system worked because of um, I shifted the yellow to be more orangey, too. So I used to have cad lemon and cad yellow light, but they're just too much alike. Cad yellow le uh, light is just a little tiny bit orangier than lemon. But 
when I shifted to cadmium lemon and cadmium yellow medium or even deep sometimes, um, I felt the system had a lot more uh, a lot more distinction between a yellow that biases green and a yellow that biases orange. But then it got redundant between the two yellow, uh, between the yellow medium or deep and the cad red light. They were both too orangey. So the system to me worked better when I got cad yellow medium and cad red medium. It was a purer red, not not as orange. All right, this system's working better. So, like I said, third time's a charm. If I had to do a fourth, I would do it. And it's starting to show a little bit of movement in the cloth. And like I said, I don't have to change that. I can just embrace it. So it's not like I'm being overly picky. It's just I wasn't ready to ad lib too much that early. In fact, I don't, I actually don't like how long those are getting. So I thought that was true and it's not. And we'll do another little problem solve. So the problem solve to me is better to cut down on the openings rather than to add. And it's usually just one or the other. So I'm opting to close down this gap just a little from both uh, the bottom thicknesses of the top weave and the top weave of the bottom. And that little, that little bit on both adds to each other. It's not going to matter the more it gets. But again, it's just all about building that system. Uh oh. Ah, oh, that's why. All right, let's bear, bear with me for just a second. <laughs> Yeah, if you're watching on uh, Zoom, that camera's going to bounce around just a little bit. I pulled the cord out of the wall, and it just went to the low battery. So I have to untangle the cord, and it, yeah, now we're back. Hopefully, if it's acknowledging the cord. Let's see if it's acknowledging the cord. No. Why? No, it is. Okay, we're good. Can you see? Um, not really. Not really. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go put it back. I'm sorry. Yes. It looked like it should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah perfectly. Oh, okay, Maliki, you're okay. I don't know who's yeah. where. I guess if I'm talking to you, you're on, um, on Zoom. Yeah, I, I didn't realize I pulled the phone out of the wall. All right, maybe I, I don't know what to do here. Really hoping to get to a different section today. This, this is boring.
But again, just a lot of figuring out. It, it's not hard once I get a system. And I just want to build that system. So I would say, I mean, it may not look like it, but I've, I'd say I got a lot done already. Yeah, it, it's just, it's slow going. It's going to be faster, but more tedious. That's the, that's the pattern. It's always gone. And this is usually the stage where in the past I thought, oh, this isn't working, but it almost always looks, I mean, no, I'm not going to say always, it always looks better. Uh, the more pattern I put in, that's the way it's worked every time. So right now, all the little you know, uh, discrepancies, they have a big presence to them. But as the whole system kind of supports itself, they, these, the, little, the little things that don't look good right on this sitting just kind of blend in with the whole. So not being faithful to the cloth and not trying to second guess too much. I just felt like before that system just couldn't work for the scale of uh, this previous section. And it was worth fixing. But I'm, I'm definitely not getting mired into exact patterns. I think that's for some and not others. It's definitely not for me. I don't think so. I mean, I've been in in the studio with him on those final sittings. He's happy as a clam, just sitting there, zoning out and watching a TV show or a movie. How can he do that? I, I wouldn't be able to do that, I don't think. Well, because by the time he gets to those stages, the painting is already beautiful. He's just making it more refined with small brushwork, but the painting is already there. So like I said, I mean, his first sitting is pretty wild. I mean, it's well drawn. It's exaggerated colors, but loose brush strokes, pretty big shapes, scumbly backgrounds. It's breathtaking. Never met an artist yet that didn't love that first sitting enough to say, stop, you're done. Mm -hmm. Or at least the second sitting. But then he'll blend it down, he'll sand it, and then build it up again. Second sitting, still pretty expressive, but slightly smaller brush strokes. Um, and then blend it, sand it, do it again. Slightly smaller shapes, you know, more honed in, softer edges. Blend it, sand it, do it again. Slightly so smaller brush strokes. Um, it makes all the textures disappear, but not the not the brush strokes. Oh, okay. So by the time he's on the final sitting, it's surprisingly thick paint. It's a lot of layers. Really? Uh -huh. And that first sitting is not light on the paint. It's just blended down so it doesn't have little ridges of brush strokes. And then sanding it gets rid of the, the remaining ridges from the blending that, you know, survived the blending. Like I said, that in 05, he had to do that one-man show where he didn't have enough of his paintings to do a one-man show. So he had to acquiesce to putting in those two or three sitting paintings that I thought were incredible. And so did John Pence. So Pence, you know, made it a rule that no buyer could buy more than two paintings. Just because he didn't want one buyer to buy out all these, these two, three sitting paintings. 
that's how popular they were. That's what prompted the question is like, well, if they're so popular, if they're so successful, why don't you just do more of these? And he said, well, because your style picks you, you don't pick your style. So I'm definitely not as tight of a painter as say like Will or Tony Wychulis or, you know, the, some of the other guys from Schuler school. Tony didn't graduate. He came for three years, but before Schuler's, he was with uh, Mike Molnar, who was a, Schuler, a, a graduate from the Institute. He studied under my grandmother. So he had, he had a lot of influence from the Schuler school too. But again, he, he wanted to be a trompoy artist. He wanted to do so much detail that it fooled the eye that you could believe that there was another dimension to the painting. And, uh, you know, we have, we have some artists that came out of the Shore School that are super loose, right? And sometimes even not realistic and it's perfectly okay. Cause we're just, we're teaching skills and you can do whatever you want with those skills. the metals. Yep. Almost all the problem solving is on the fundamentals. And all the creativity, if you're doing it realistically, is on the fundamentals. Because then you can create with a, a feeling of the light source describing volume. Not only through light and dark, but also through edges and texture and color theory and atmosphere and perspective. And it's a big gobbledygook of information if you're trying to struggle to think about all those things simultaneously. But a lot of them just become like tying your shoe. Yeah, that's what I want. But tying a shoe, I mean, have you ever seen a, a little kind of baby learn how to walk? Mm -mm. The mechanics of walking are incredible. We just take it for granted. Wow. You know, what I meant was that I wanted to be, you know, to become second nature. Yeah, eventually. that's the goal. Yeah. That's the goal, and so that's so we we do a lot of repetition, right? Say the same yeah. things over and over and over again. We set up yeah. paintings that are different from each other, and so those same fundamentals are described in a in a different way. And then you just gain mastery that way. So, you know, that's what the cool thing about like in one week doing watercolor with oils with sculpture. I mean, you're really getting it well-rounded is like how you're going to adapt to the fundamentals from a lot of different ways, like a lot of different media and subject matter. Now, that, now you really know the fundamentals. That's why every time I see somebody doing quick sketches from the model, I encourage them to get out of their seat and do it from a slightly different angle. And now it's going to be different shapes, different, uh, you know, perspective of those features. It's not, it's not the same. It, it doesn't become more like a formula where I'm, I'm just drawing it kind of the way I just did draw it. Not that that's not good practice too. But. Oh, yeah. Okay. Are you talking about like the, um, the gestures? No, I'm talking about like on, well, sometimes on a uh, figure class when we do like a three, a three hour pose or something. Yeah, instead of drawing from the same angle every time. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I want. Yeah, maybe we should do that. Shuffle around. Shuffle around. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do gestures where the model is, is constantly shifting. You know, 
three minute poses, two minute poses. Yeah, but I'm but for a longer pose for the twenty minutes. Yeah, so you might be inclined to start, you know, and and just do a second one and a third one and a fourth one when everyone else is using the full three hours. That's okay. I was just saying that it'd be better to problem solve from a slightly different angle. Not slightly, but from a different angle. You'll have different shapes of shadows, say like the nose uh, will be, you know, turned away from you this time as opposed to straight on the previous one, things like that. Just gain more insight. I will do that tomorrow. Okay. So I was talking about a natural distortion. This is getting distorted. So I'll probably glaze this into a shadow. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. So these, these holes are bigger and the shapes are bigger with it. And these are smaller and they're turning with it. So I'm going to turn that into a, a ripple. I could just wipe it off again. Like, no, like that. that pattern isn't quite working. If I wanted to stay really consistent, these are these openings are getting bent. So I don't see it on there, but I, I see the potential of it in other areas of the of the um, pattern. So again, it it can be adapted to suit what happens naturally. It's not like I intended to do that, but it's kind of unfolding in a nice way. No, I could do it that way too and just create slightly bigger openings and then it'd be more consistent. But I like that idea of it getting a little distorted here. I was like, this pattern is pulling it a little wide here. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick with that for now. I can, I can still change things. And I haven't really resolved this side yet. And so I can close down that stretch just a little. So I like it, but it might be a little too much. And so I was just inspired to change it a tiny bit to where it's happening, but it's a little less than a second ago. So we'll embrace that little turn, that little perspective of the cloth kind of getting uh, maybe a tiny bit foreshortened with a wrinkle, but also a little bit stretched by these bigger patterns. And again, it's not completely made up because I can witness it in other areas of the painting or of the cloth, but it's definitely not happening here exactly that same way. And it's always the decision. It's like, well, what do I want? Getting a bit of a headache, and we're at like the three hour mark. Okay. So I can keep going for a little while longer. I just don't want to get sloppy. Make, make, I don't mind if you, um, if you stop at all. Yeah. Well, no rush. I, I'll go a little longer. But I just wanted to give a heads up that. I probably won't continue all of this out. That's fine. It's looking really great. It is. Thank you. Yeah. I totally understand that you're getting a headache. Uh, if I was doing that, I wouldn't have been able to get this far in one sitting. Well, I had a headache when we started. It was just mild. It's getting worse. <laughs> Can't put my finger on why, but these things happen. I get headaches. I it was bad for a while, and I almost I almost uh, took a nap, and I just thought is like I might not want to paint after taking this nap, so I didn't. I did a little workout instead, and my headache went away for a little while, and then it was coming. It was starting to come back at the beginning of the sitting. 
and now it's coming back fully. <laughs> Do you have salmon near you? Sometimes when I have a gamsol near me, that's when. Um, I start you know, drinking. I don't, but I. No, that's dry. I saw that there was a bottle of awesome that was open, but it's it's completely dry. It's empty. So I don't think that would be it. I should get it out of there. Maybe the fumes are just kind of filling the air. Maybe that could be it. But the headache I had before the sitting had nothing to do with the studio. Could just be I haven't been sleeping well. Yeah, that's always a big contributor. Nice. Uh, so I just forced myself to yawn <laughs> by by putting that in the air. All right, so this is lace. It's a pattern that's going to uh, kind of emerge. I'm I'm still not fully convinced that this works yet, but I'm also feeling like it's too early to judge it and bother to change it. And I think it's very very likely that as I get more pattern, it'll work. And so again, I'm just going to, I'm just going to call it this section done for now and keep moving. That's a very important feature for my paintings because I do work from simple and abstract to small and refined. And what I find is that I can get the whole painting harmonious, harmonious if I just keep moving rather than feeling like I have to get any one section perfect. Uh, cause even if I if I don't like it by the time I fill up the end, which is, you know, I think it's very likely that I'll like it a lot more. But even if I do feel like changing it, I'll have a lot more information to do that. So I again, I'd much rather just keep moving forward. And that's a different conversation than the beginning of this pattern that just simply didn't have the right scale. And this was a good time to fix it because it's dry paint. Mm -hmm. uh, I could just wipe it right off. So I, I felt like that was worth changing, but the specificity of these compared to that, I, I don't, I don't think so. I think that's going to work just fine. Or again, if I do refine it, it'll be because I have a ton of information to work with. Look at the whole painting, get that first impression again and see what's essential and what's not uh maybe even just pick up on something that happened here like this pattern getting a little looks like it's getting pulled and twisted so i might just turn that into a shadow i'm going to glaze this shadow anyway so i'm just going to try it these holes are getting a little big and it doesn't feel like it's happening because of the cloth distorting so that would be worth closing it down and it's not like anything's a formula i just it's a feel it's just I look at it and say, okay, this works and this doesn't. Um, maybe somebody painting this would have a different opinion. So it, it, it's just what I feel like in the moment. Well, I still have this great chance to wipe it off if I don't like it. But right now, the problem solved is just those holes are too big. I'm going to experiment with making them smaller from both sides and then take another little glance back at it. So I, I hopefully that doesn't come across as me being like totally perfectionist on this because if I was, then I'd be counting little strings and making sure that it's perfect. I'm, I'm creating the painting that I want and I'm just trying to do it by just kind of being honest with myself, not accepting something that is a mistake just because I don't want to do it again, but truly seeing is it something I like, something I can work with, something I can make a just creative decision with. And um, yeah, so far so good. Okay. And this this looks to me like it's distorted. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make that work. So yeah, I mean do you think it's because I can see a bit of a wrinkle in the tablecloth too? There are wrinkles, just not in this section. 
So I'm going to make it into one. And I'm going to make it work by referencing another area, but also just making it my own. And sometimes, sometimes that works in my head more than it works on the painting. And then I just make a little adjustment. If push comes to shove, I could always mix this gray and paint opaquely over it, let it dry, and then do it again. Right? So I'm not really that worried about it. And all paintings have to start somewhere. Right? Whether that's I did a meticulous studies on the side, and now I don't have to make any decisions, or like the way I prefer to paint is to make a loose plan and be a little flexible. And I, I prefer that way of painting. Yeah. So did not make it as far as I thought. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I think it's a lot of progress. Yeah, in a way it is. In a way it is. Because again, just yeah. Just rushing things doesn't really work. But I expected to be able to do this webbing through here. So I, I'm not that far off, but I also expected to maybe touch up a few other areas, but it just didn't happen. It looks good. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of it's a lot of tedium. And right here it's the tedium with the problem solving and getting a system yeah. and um, it's working not perfect but it's working uh, I will again video record all of this um, it'll probably be over a few sittings and I'll combine them to do a little video I'll still do that uh, wallpaper one too I just haven't gotten to it Because it, it's already recorded. It's on the clicks one. But I feel like those early videos, I yeah, I love those tunes, the the um, those classical music pieces. But I've gotten a lot of feedback that it's just too, too intense. So I think it'd be better to just do a little clip and talk over kind of what I was thinking when I made that uh Wallpaper. I just have to decide whether I want to do it as a short, which is has to be a minute or less, or a longer video. I'll see if I can make a script for it in under a minute. I probably shouldn't do that though, because I'm way far off of, of hitting those marks on YouTube for um, shorts. It's probably a better idea to just keep building the watch hours. Yeah, like four thousand to to have the partnership program, and three to get some advertisement. And I'm at like twelve hundred. Oh, you're getting closer. Yeah. yeah, it's progress. I'm really close on subscriptions. And that's one of the that's one of the two metrics. It's it's subscription and watch time. Okay. All right. About five more minutes. And I'm gonna sign off. I guess I'm used to never stopping without like a, a warning. That's for my voice. <laughs> you got it. Was that? They give you the warning. No, I have to give them the warning. It's like oh. you got to be done with that in five minutes, and then we have to go to school. Because <laughs> if you just if you just say okay, you're done with no warning, then that you're gonna just get either a big rebellion or <laughs> or they'll just kind of keep going and then you have to stop them which
goes so much better if you give them the little warning. It's like, you got to be done in one minute. The other thing I can do, let's say I, I let's say I can't reconcile that spot. I could I can opaquely blast it right away and create a, a distressed spot as if the tablecloth got ripped a little bit. I don't think you really need to do that. I don't need to. I, like I said, it, it's it's in my bag of tricks and it it might be one of those things where I'd say, okay, it could be a little bit more exciting. And one of those holes might look good. Yeah, that's, that's true. Kind of like, well, would, that wouldn't be a Trump lawyer, would it? Um, I, there's a fine line. I think of that as just a, a tight still life with a tablecloth with a distress hole. I mean, a lot of times they just call really tight realism trompe l'oeil. I don't think, I think there, there has to be an element that uh, breaks that three-dimensional illusion into a fourth dimension, in my opinion. I don't think that's true for everyone's opinion. Because they had that whole show in D.C. called Deceptions and Illusions. It was a long time ago. It's a really great show, but a lot of those were just tight still lifes. In my opinion, again, I guess there are the experts being from the museum, but. Do you know that girl, um, the woman, she comes on Tuesday nights, her name is Cassie? Yeah, Cassie Sondergren. Yeah, I don't know her last name, but she does some Trump boy that's really good. I don't think I've ever seen her do a Trump boy. Yeah, I mean, she's really good at it. Mostly she does like little portraits of you know i think she did her husband one time and her and one of her kids the other and um she did a landscape once i don't know i haven't taught night school in a while though yeah she did um i think they were they were tomatoes or something and um Ooh, did she use cadmium tomato <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she had a frame around it, and I thought, I, I was thinking when I saw her painting it, I said, why are you painting inside the frame, you know, inside this frame that, in this painting? I didn't ask for that, but I was thinking it, but that was a painting. Yeah, yeah, when you paint, when you paint the frame so that you can paint the, like, brush stroke outside, like something coming outside of the frame, that's Trump boy. That's breaking. Like the image is the illusion of three dimensional depth, and that's going outside of that three dimensional depth. Well, that I call true Trump boy. Oh, thank you, Anna. On YouTube. <laughs> I know I've been talking to you two, and you two are on Zoom. So that's who I was talking to. Anna Petty artist saying it's convincing. That's nice to say. It is. You know, I saw that um, if that's the same person, that she was very excited that you were painting lights. Right? Who did you talk to? No, I didn't and, talk to At her. the Schuller School? It was at the comments. Oh, okay. Now I, I was confused. Yeah, I thought you meant at like school. I don't know. Uh, Okay, was that five minutes? It's 1040 now. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm going to continue all this. We'll record it all. You'll see every brush stroke, but you'll see it a heck of a lot faster. And then we can concentrate like at least Saturday nights, if not the occasional Tuesday or Wednesday uh, on shelves and baskets and stuff. So that's, that's the system I'm going to do. At least you got to see some of it live. 
super duper slow. Uh, and uh, there might be some problems to solve uh, later when I get all this blocked in and I can step back and say, okay, is that inconsistent with the rest of the painting? So uh, again, it, the, the shadows you're gonna get into here, so they're missing right now. Uh, I'm gonna do those when it's dry and just keep blasting forward with the rest of the pattern. I'm really convinced it's gonna work and I'm glad you joined me. Thank you guys, thank you. You're welcome, great. thank you. See you tomorrow, bye. Yep. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Okay. Let me just get this a little closer. So you can already see a little bit of the undulation of the cloth. Some of it was because I observed it and some of it was because it's kind of adapting to what ended up happening and just embracing the little quirks that happened from just blocking this in. Um, you can saw, saw that I wiped off some areas that I didn't feel like I could reconcile with a creative decision. And I don't want to settle for anything that I don't like. Um, but that does, that's not to say that it has to be perfect. So, okay. Well, thanks for joining me. I'm going to sign off now. And I really enjoy having you with me. And uh, we'll, we'll do more exciting things. And you'll definitely be able to see that video. And I'll make sure everybody knows when I do put it out. So, good night. And hope to see you soon.